We are talking steel bezels, orange hands, and GMT functionality. Now look, there's no way in really knowing where the next generation Black Bay is going to go. We have a good few ideas seeing the latest iteration and how various things are changing in the right direction. I think there are a lot of easily understandable, irrefutable elements that are going to be incorporated in with these new pieces. But the Black Bay Pro is a strange one. It's a real oddball, a model that, believe it or not, introduced quite a handful of significant things that we're going to talk about. And I really enjoy these exercises where I'm able to take a design and see where it might go next, using what we have as background evidence, see how we can evolve it further. So let's have some fun. When we think of some of the strangest pieces Tudor has given us in recent years, our minds wander to a model like the P01. It's odd. It's got a really cool backstory being a prototype issued to the Navy that was ultimately rejected, but it's still extremely odd and it doesn't make a lot of practical sense today when we think of how the bezel was implemented and the technology used at the time. But seeing Tudor actually approach and give us a model like this in a modern format is great and I wish they did more of it. The success of Tudor's P01 is debatable because it's not everyone's cup of tea, but that uniqueness is something quite desirable. And whether we like it or not, Tudor for the most part, they have moved away from their more out there designs from the early years in favor of more universally acceptable, appealing models. Of course, you don't need me to tell you the drawbacks of having this sort of approach. I mean, on a positive side, more sales, more international focus and interest. The negative, on the other hand, so many models in collections, they lose that uniqueness. They lose that originality. Most importantly, and this is quite soul destroying, is that its design its original edge is diluted in favor of mass appeal, in favor of more watches and derivatives of such a watch. So where in recent years we had models like the North Flag, now being replaced with a model like the Tudor Ranger, far more appealing, but it does lose that edge that the North Flag had in its design. Where this watch could have evolved and expanded is anyone's guess, but there was so much more opportunity to be a far more original design that was not taken. The North Flag was perfect, paying tribute to the North Greenland expedition where the Ranger doesn't necessarily belong there. You know, there's a big difference between having an original design and a derivative. Something that is obviously paying tribute to another model that's not necessarily its own. And maybe subconsciously, the enthusiast does think about this at the back of their mind. But Tudor is not the only name to do it. Look at Omega and the Speedmaster. Their most popular models are the classics and the limited editions. That's where all the main interest is. Everything in between, not looked at so much. Some with more unique, more original designs that are swept aside in favor of the comfort factor. Now look at Rolex with the Submariner, the GMT, the Sea Dweller, and the Explorer 2. This is the same design used in slightly different ways. And I think a lot of us deep down agree that it's a design that deserves to belong with the Submariner, the Dive Watches, the GMTs, not so much the Explorer 2. But then sticking with the Rolex name, a better example, one watch that has had so much appeal in recent years for its strangeness and its sort of ugly duckling appeal is the 1655 Explorer 2. If you've known this channel for a while now, you would know that I've spoken about this watch to death over the last, what, five years. It's a model that the designer and me cannot get enough of because of its odd design, but for the masses, it screams unique in a largely populated Rolex sports category. It's 1970s in every way. It's clear, it's concise, it uses great spot colors with a very interesting to look at racing dial aesthetic. And the enthusiasts look to this watch not only because of its rarity, but because it is inherently special in how it addressed its design. And it's something that I would say we have not seen from the brand since on a professional level. I think the closest example of a watch that has this kind of strangeness associated is the latest Air King. We're going to get back to Tudor in a second, bear with me. I've always found it a shame that the Explorer 2 evolved the way it did. How the design eventually boiled down to fitting a fixed steel bezel onto a GMT case, and that loss of its originality of a racing track dial in favor of legibility. And look, I get it, from a manufacturing point of view, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's a cheaper exercise to achieve. From a fit for purpose exercise, it also ticks the box. But my argument is that its design could be so much more exciting than it currently is. The white dial makes a nice difference though. With all of that out of the way, we have seen Tudor build up their portfolio and the Black Bay has become their backbone. Try and say that five times. 
and it is arguably one of the most successful modern watches of the last decade. I think repetition has played a great part in their success, as well as the fact that their designs, they're more iterative and they're not necessarily completely wiping the slate clean and starting again. I think there is something to read into that, I believe, which has been my primary argument about a watch like the Breitling Super Ocean. I'll link that video in the corner of the screen. Where design should be an iterative process, where we see subtle changes and improvements. So with the success of the Black Bay GMT, which was huge, out of the woodwork came the Black Bay Pro. Did anyone ask for this watch? I don't think so, not that I can remember. But it has been very well received, and believe it or not, it offered a lot of firsts in the Black Bay collection. The first Black Bay GMT in 39mm, the first steel Black Bay to incorporate a T-fit system, I believe the first Tudor to use full ceramic plots on its dial, which made a world of difference with luminosity. The first Black Bay to have a fixed brush steel bezel with numerals printed on it, and also the first Black Bay to use a professional oriented crown. Bigger, more knurling. Come to think of it, when you break it down, there were a lot of special things that this watch implemented for the first time, and very quickly, for most of us enthusiasts, it became the more affordable variant of the Explorer 2. We can see clear as day that the approach was to borrow a lot of elements from the 1655. If Rolex wasn't interested in using this past design, I think Tudor incorporating it was a great idea. And the funniest thing of all is that under the surface, this is also one of the most interesting black bays that we have been given in recent years. It's not just another dive watch, it's not another GMT, it's looking more along the lines of what the P01 was doing. So the question is, was this Tudor's version of a Frankenstein watch, an amalgamation of parts and elements that they have now incorporated into the rest of the family? Like when we look to the Pelagos, we start seeing how the loom's been applied. Like we look to the Black Bay collection in general, how the T-foot clasp is now fully implemented. Much like the P01, the Pro could be seen as the prototype, and it's now questioning whether or not this watch will survive to see its next generation, or whether it will be discontinued. Frankly, I think from the success of this watch now branching out into being that more affordable Explorer 2, it would be a big mistake for this to disappear out of the catalog. And the challenge I set myself was to come up with a design that would look a bit more appropriate, a little bit more advanced than the current generation, but offer a lot of the modern spec that we are currently seeing. The first challenge is questioning the choice of movement. Once Tudor gives us a thinner profile, it will make a big difference to the watch and how it wears on the wrist. As it is right now, the GMT caliber the Tudor is using measures 8mm in thickness. The only hope is that once these movements advance with Meta certification and are slimmer in profile, will we then see more appropriately scaled case proportions. Sacrilegious as it might be, I played around with the idea of incorporating crown guards on this range. Maybe the thought of using an all titanium case and bracelets, similar to the Pelagos 39. Why don't they just use that case? And then it comes down to the small refinements on the dial. No more three lines of text, two lines instead, similar to how we are seeing the current generation of the Black Bay. I played around with the idea of making the hour hand shorter and wider so it fits on the dial, it's a bit more presentable and easy to distinguish. But the most vital change that'll make all the difference to this watch is enlarging the triangle at the 12 and the batons at the 6 and the 9. Once again, making the parts more distinguishable, eliminating some of that negative space and ultimately calling back to the 1655 a lot closer. It's crazy to think that when you step back and look at it, the changes are so minuscule but make a big difference, and there's not much needed to be changed to make it an even greater contender. I think that's the real beauty of iteration and refinement, as you see that pattern, you see how it changes, and it's quite easy to predict its future and where it develops next. I think to make the model stand out that little bit more, the use of the five-link bracelet would be a nice touch. Maybe adding a painted white frame around the date window. But these are just a few ideas of where this watch might go, and it's always exciting to put these ideas forward and see what materializes. I for one will be disappointed if this watch is discontinued and not taken forward, because its foundation is all there, it's ready to be built upon. But I think it all boils down to when Tudor is going to implement a new GMT complication, which is something we've all been waiting for. When that happens, then the sky is the limit. We're going to see the current GMT change a lot. We might see the Pelagos receive a GMT, and it might also trickle down to the Pro. But then in the case of most of these unique and interesting designs that are often sidelined for the more acceptable, approachable models, there is no knowing where the Black Bay Pro is going to go. And whether or not this piece has a future, we will just have to wait and see. I always enjoy doing these design exercises and trying to put myself in the shoes of those responsible for the job and what they could do. Um, this just feels like a natural progression of how it's going to change. 
I'll say it again, it's quite baffling that this is the most original and unique Black Bay that we have seen in, <laughs> in a very long time, since the P01, I would argue. And I think fans enjoy it because it does ride under the radar and doesn't look like your typical diver or GMT model. It gives you more of an impression that it's built tough and built to be a professional's watch. And there's, you know, there's hope that we might see it changed. Thank you, as always, for taking the time to watch this video. I would be interested in knowing your thoughts of where this watch is going to go next and what its future might be and how it situates itself with you. Do you think it's a worthy watch of being here or if it should be discontinued and move aside? See you in the next one.